Hey everybody, so Chris here from the Off Grid School. We have Aaron from Broccoli Bus. So when it comes to solar, he is my go-to, one of the most knowledgeable guys with solar. So what we're going to talk about today is just a conversation about solar systems in general, uh, what to expect, the realities of it, and if you want, go ahead and give a brief introduction to who you are and how you sure. get into the RVing side of solar. Yeah. So I'm Aaron Brockley. Uh Our bus is called Broccoli Bus or Broccoli Bus Six on Instagram. And uh, I got into solar because I had to solve some technical problems. Um, one of them was running a generator all the time, and I really didn't want to do that. Um, so it was a multi-year uh, uh, decision process and exploratory thing going on to get to the point of basically deciding that that was the right route to go. Um, I didn't know shit about it before when I started. I don't know if you can swear on these or not, but maybe you can. <laughs> I think we can. I think we can. And uh, so so I started out knowing very little. Solar panels, that's those things on calculators, right? You know, you turn, you shine in the sun, you never need to put a battery in. I mean, maybe a little more. Like, I obviously had known solar panels were a thing, and they put them on houses and stuff like that. But I didn't know anything about the realities of that at the point. So it was sort of this learning process of going along and 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 digging into it over the years so so with your bus that was your first recreational vehicle yeah so literally this is the first it was the first a lot of firsts it was like the first decision to own an rv the first decision to go anywhere in an rv the first decision to buy an rv uh then like the first of oh let's convert a used school bus into an rv and like build all the stuff and also I've never dealt with off-grid systems before. I've never, I've just lived in a house, your normal house where you got, you pay utility bill, you pay your gas bill, water, um, all of that. I had, you know, in the past looked at solar to the point of going, wow, that's expensive, I'm not doing that. And for any type of house stuff or whatever, it was like, yeah, just, I don't know, it just never really occurred to me or was part of my life goals. And then when my wife and I um, decided this was gonna be a thing, I started really, maybe not panicking, but getting extremely concerned about how we were actually going to pull this off, um, not being plugged into RV parks everywhere. Because I mean, obviously, like there's millions of RV or hundreds of thousands or millions of RVs that are produced all the time. They're all made in what Indiana? Indiana's um, yeah. big hub for sure. Elkhart mm -hmm. and. Uh, somebody's figured out how this all works and you look at most of those they have like a couple token panels because or none at all and people live but then when you start really looking into it, what they're doing they drive from site to site and they plug in as soon as they get there so they're more like um holders just enough to get you from spot to spot yeah just enough to spot to spot to spot they have generators that run to provide the power for things they have little battery banks to kind of supply the difference but generally, they're just like mini houses. They're they're designed to be grid, have grid uh, dependencies, and that's just fine because most people that's all they really want. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one of our goals early on was to try to try to kick that trend a little bit because we thought it would be cheaper to to not be plugged in all the time, and also we wanted to have a different experience, one where we could park anywhere we needed to mm -hmm. or, or whatever. And not have to be looking for that plug-in or trying to stress about that. So what was the process of deciding? Because I know what some people do, instead of paying tens of thousands of dollars for a solar kit, what they'll do is just go get one of the Honda generators and just have that thing running all the time. They're super dependable, they're very mm -hmm. efficient. What was the thought process for, for you from picking these massive solar setup that you have versus just going with a generator? So this is going to sound counterintuitive, illogical, and stupid, but I was like, boy, those haunted generators are really expensive. I can't afford that. <laughs> Which is really funny. It's like, you know, those, the, was it the Honda U 2000 IS was at the time. Now they got the slightly they got the 3, bigger 000. version. Mm -hmm. and they got the 3000 now too. Mm -hmm. And I think the progression of thought was, well, I'll get a 2000 and a giant block of lead acid trojan batteries the the t105s and the six volt batteries and time all together and an inverter would be done and then it was like well that doesn't really work because i have to run the generator a lot so let's get a 3000 is and then i was thinking about those and then i kind of was like 
I don't really want gasoline because the vehicle's diesel. And so then I started looking at diesel generators and I was like, all these diesel generators are crap or they're hilariously over the top expensive, like a true real. So there's like two different classes of diesel generators you can basically shove into a, into an RV that I've seen. There's the cheap ones, which turn at 3,600 RPM. Then there's the expensive ones that turn at 1,800 RPM. And there's a special reason they turn at that speed in the US because they have to generate a 60 Hertz frequency for the generator. So the slow ones have double the windings, but they need twice as much torque and they got a more expensive, fancier generator section of it. And those are nice because they're quiet. When they run really slow like that, 1800 RPM, they're really nice and quiet. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're like twelve, fourteen thousand dollars to start for a generator like that. And I was right. like, dude, that's that's a lot. Yeah, you see those a lot in the bigger, fancy class oh, yeah. A's. If you want a million dollar class A coach, no problem. There's a big tray, they slide out, big green Onan thing or whatever. Right. And, dude, they're super nice. I mean, they can run everything. They're 12, 14 kilowatt generators. Did you ever consider actually going to an RV scrapyard and picking those up? You can get them for you know, four or 5,000 typically, right? Or was it more than that? There's, they're still valued really high. And then when you get them in the scrapyard, they're beat to hell with 12,000, 15,000 hours on them. So it's like, okay, so you buy a generator for five grand. And then now you're going to put five more th thousand dollars into rebuilding the whole thing, and you're basically right back to brand new. It's like it's mm -hmm. it's that devalued cost out of it. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like cars or buses, you know. <laughs> Go buy a cheap bus, and you'll end up spending a bazillion dollars to put it back to a state that you can really truly drive it everywhere. Yeah, that was um, my case. Three thousand dollars for this bus to get tires that it needed cost uh, thirty five hundred. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, I know exactly how that is. <laughs> I think in the, just to not even talking about any of the livable, if I just, if it was just a bus driving around, I've probably put about 14,000 this year. Well, this year, and last year into the vehicle. Well, you had a massive in frame. I had an in well. frame. I had a transmission rebuild. I had a differential or differential rebuild. All replacement. the big pieces. And then of course, when I bought it, I had brought new tires. So you tack all those together and it's like that. That six thousand dollar bus turns into a twenty six thousand dollar bus very quickly. Yeah. Very very yeah. quickly. So you decided not to go the generator route. What was the thought process of going into the Nissan Leaf battery? Uh, you it know, you, wasn't a Leaf at first. It wasn't a Leaf at first. No. You had something else. No, I had. I, so part of this is kind of like. So my experience is not anything what to do with batteries, but probably technical specification. I worked in the IT industry for a long time and um, got into doing a lot of definition of services based on a business signal or demand. Like, oh, we need to host all these applications and what do we need to do that? So you just start following the, the, the trail back to the fundamentals of it. So if you want to do this with this many people, what are the capabilities and stack requirements for that? And that travels all the way back. Uh, sometimes to physical requirements like an actual true data center mm -hmm. where you need to have power cooling physical space you know all the manpower operations all that stuff has to be spec'd out and designed sometimes it's cloud-based internet-based so you have to still figure out what all the the opex for all that is because you're paying rent effectively for somebody else's data center that's all cloud is is you're renting somebody else's data center abstracted at some point so that sort of design process of looking for that was uh, kind of similar. It's like a design spiral. So it started out with, uh, went from the generator mindset to, well, okay, so what else can I use for instead of generator? Well, solar generating, like, so I could put solar panels on it. And I was still thinking about the lead acid batteries at the time. And then I started really looking at the, a number of lead acid batteries required to, to fulfill the requirements, the solar requirements to fill the requirements of lead acid. And you realize that lead acid is like, it's got, there's pure kit effects, internal resistance, all sorts of weird things that lead acid really needs to be successful. One of them is like, you basically treat them as a uh, uh, load bank all the time, but you can't really discharge them deeply and fully without killing them really fast. So you start reading a lot of stories about people um, replacing their battery sets every two or three years and then other people there's always that outlier that guy says oh i haven't changed my agm batteries in 20 years and i'm like that's because you've just been plugged in for the entire 20 years and so it's like yeah you know there's some things and so that started looking into like okay so if i don't want to run a generator and i want to run solar i have to have this many batteries and i realized that suddenly to get enough batteries 
to do the stuff I want was a lot. And that was actually super important too. I started looking at what are we really trying to accomplish being off road? And that was, or off grid, I should say. And uh, the, the primary goal, honestly, was air conditioning. That drove it. And like, that's the that's the Mount Everest of off-grid living is that everybody says, you can't run air conditioning. And then I think in the last couple of years, it's definitely changed. Like I think having these lithium battery setups and stuff has started to change that perspective. Mm -hmm. But um, like Technomadia was one of the um, early blogs in like 2014 that was, they were trying to, to do that in their uh, GM PD 4106, their Greyhound bus that they did. Mm -hmm. And they basically said, yeah, you could do it, but holy cow, it's expensive and it's not going to really work and you got to do all these other things. And they had some very good, like, try living in the shade instead of, you know, solving it with brute technical force. And uh, I've never, I've, I've always been kind of interested in challenges like that. So like, as an exercise, it was like, let's see what it would actually take. And my numbers penciled out to be a little more actually than what even they had said. Um, as far as power requiring wire, power requirements, system integration requirements, like how much insulation are you putting, how many windows, what's the R, the effective calculative R value of your enclosure, all this stuff that kind of started feeding into it. So that was this huge design spiral around why are we even bothering with doing off-grid power on a big, large-scale basis, and uh, that that was really it took a long time to kind of figure that out and come to terms with that. At some point, I don't remember when it was, it was probably like 2015 or 2016, I was in the middle of the build doing stuff and uh, um, I, generators just went out the door. I was like, nah, generators is going to be a secondary thing maybe, it's going to have to be something to augment a solar system. And at some point around that same point, it was also lead acids out the door, like no way, it's not going to happen. And as soon as you discard lead acid, the world's kind of like expands to this huge, crazy unknown of like, well, we're we using nickel metal hydride, nickel cadmium, iron phosphate, LIFEPO, you know, all these different ca chemistries available for stuff. I, I briefly looked at hydrogen fuel cells just because like, why not, you know, we get to tank a liquid hydrogen in the bus. None of those were really realistic. And the only thing that I could find that was even remotely affordable was uh, power walls. So I started looking at power walls. There's like a DIY power wall forum that was on Facebook and some other stuff that was out on the internet and other forums. And basically, if you wanted to buy a power wall, it's going to, like Tesla or whatever, it's going to be super special requirements that they dictate, which throws an RV right out the window. You can't. You could go kind of get risky shopping stuff, go over to Alibaba and go buy some giant metal Chinese box full of mystery batteries that claims on paper to look awesome, but then you're like, well, how do you get support for that? And it's like, I don't know. And then there's a couple of vendors in the US when you start looking at the price comparison and really what they're doing, they're just buying the Chinese batteries and slapping a sticker on them. Maybe they're probably doing QC and stuff. At the time, Battleborn didn't exist and uh, Later on, Battleborn did exist, and but the price point was too high for me. Like to get to that point, it was like, man, it's just really expensive. And so, I sort of fell upon um, EV batteries were kind of the the correct form factor for me. An electric vehicles, EV. Yeah, electric vehicle, because of the similar packaging considerations. You've got a you got a thing that's vibrating and bouncing around down the road. It's subject to extreme heat and cooling. Um, and there's a lot of very similar aspects. You're just using the power for different reasons. You're not using it for tractive force. You're move, using it for storage. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started learning about all that stuff. And it turned out that um, storage, using it for energy storage on kind of a low impact, relatively low impact, as opposed to tractive force, it's, it gives the batteries a pretty... Uh, um, easy life over the period of time. So then it was like trying to come up with the form factor. Like, am I going to do a bunch of 18650 cells like the Tesla stuff? Could I just go buy a Tesla car pack? Looked at the Tesla car packs, you know, they were kind of spendy for the size they were. And they also had interesting requirements like uh, um, water cooling and things like that. Um, I almost went with a Chevy Volt battery. I actually bought it and then was like all excited. And then I started looking into more detail. I'm ex waiting, thinking about it's going to ship. And then I realized that it's designed with these weird crimp press fittings on the battery pouches because it's like a pouch style lithium battery. 
and you'd have to get in there with like a, a, a cutoff wheel inside of a live battery and slice these weird in integrated bus bars apart to break it up and reconfigure it for a 48 volt system that would work so you could actually balance it and I completely panicked and said screw this I'm sorry guy I'm gonna return your battery I just you know sorry sorry and you know he was fine he didn't care and then uh, went back to the drawing board again and realized that the, the leaf batteries were the correct factor for, like it was really about the form factor building it up correctly so you could add the battery management system which I learned along the way that you need a BMS when you're putting together lithium stacks because of the safety and danger that kind of you have to mitigate with with putting all these cells together. Can you explain what a BMS is for those who don't know what it is? Yeah, B BMS is a, a battery management system. And so BMS is come in all shapes and sizes and purposes. Like really simple ones is like, you know those little um, battery recharge things for your cell phone that you buy like, or they're given as like party favors at a corporate office or whatever. There's basically a single battery cell in there with a little tiny chip to monitor the voltage and it just cuts off the power when it gets too low and cuts off the power when it gets too high and lets the power charge off of five volts or has a little voltage regulator. That's basically the, the smallest, crappiest BMS you can get. All the way to hilariously over the top, super interesting BMS, like in a car or a Tesla, like a Tesla or a, a Nissan Leaf. There is a BMS inside the Nissan LEAF. It has positive authority on connecting the battery to the rest of the system. It knows the voltage of every cell inside of the battery. Like it has little wires tapped to every single lithium cell inside of there, or every pair of lithium cells inside of there. And it's able to shunt the charge because all, basically in a, in a battery pack, uh, all, if you feed power through it, some of the battery, due to inequalities in the manufacturing and stuff, the chemistry chain is a little bit different in, in all those. And so if you put an um, equal amount of power, some of the batteries take the charge faster than others. And over a long period of time, they start to have differences. And a BMS can um, either monitor those differences and tell you I, this is unsafe, or it can, um, when you charge up, you know, this, this, if this is a cell and this is a cell, It'll, there's a maximum voltage you can really charge them to, and the BMS knows that this cell is at the max and it stops. So it'll say, no more. And so uh, a lesser BMS would, would just say stop, and then when you come back down, it would say stop. So you can see how my hands are moving at the same rate. Mm -hmm. um, so BMSs can also do things called charge balancing, so they can steal power from one. So there's things like top balancing, where it'll bleed off the power till it's here and lets this one charge up more. There's bottom balancing where it can go down here, and it can it can keep discharge, and it can it can actually just discharge another one uh, until it's done. In like your system with the Battleborns, each of them has a BMS packaged inside of those batteries, and so if there's charge imbalancing, you don't know what's going on, but because it's built in a big grid like a parallel parallel series or parallel, parallel grid, you kind of effectively like a weird. Um, bottom balancing system and top balancing because your batteries will discharge and when one of your batteries reaches the end of its voltage the other ones will discharge and this one disconnects itself and so you have this this um, autonomous BMS grid array inside of yours it's kind of interesting so if you think about it from a systems level so BMS is super important there's a bunch of them out there rec BMS Batrium uh, I don't know there's a bunch of Chinese ones there's all sorts of things out there and so I realized that was super important. Um, right around that same time, I found, uh, um, when I really was thinking into, about this, I found Juan from beginning from this morning and started chatting with him and you know, asking him a lot of questions about how he was doing it, and he was already, he'd already picked a BMS. Um, I basically kind of went down the same route. I didn't exactly copy him, but it was just like the design, it was a parallel structure where it was like, I looked at what he was building and I'm looking at how I'm building. I'm like, this is going to be the way it is. Like this was the most optimal configuration for 48 volt battery storage system. And, uh, and that's the Nissan Leaf. And that was the, ended up being the Nissan Leaf cells. They were relatively inexpensive. There's a lot of folks out there that, um, that sell them and resell them. I think they're buying up the full cars and decanning them and selling them as individual modules, um, marking them up, you know, for that kind of price. Um, I ended up getting a full battery pack out of a, a demolished car or a, a wrecked car. How much did you pick that up for? About 2,500 bucks for, the, for the full 48 cells, 48 cans inside of that battery. Right. So a quick, quick estimate, say we're comparing that to Battleborn, 
for twenty five hundred dollars with your Nissan Leaf, how much? How many Battleborn batteries at one hundred amp hours would you have to get the equivalent of your system? So that's a estimate. So I don't. I'd have to actually whip my calculator out because I don't usually work in amp hours. Amp hours are a misnomer nowadays. I feel like they're not. They're not. It's not invalid to use amp hours, but it's like it's difficult to calculate it because you could say amp hours at twelve volts and amp hours at 48 volts, mm. they're two very huge different things. I could say 100 amp hours at 12 volts, which is, what's, isn't that what a ba battle point yeah. is? And I could say 100 amp hours at 48 volts. That's, at 48 volts, that's four times the actual power. So if you were to uh, do it a different way, let me calculate this out here. So um, you want to use watt hours or kilowatt hours. So I find that's a way easier uh, number to, to digest. So like, a light bulb, if it's two, if it's a four watt light bulb, or you know LED, or if it's a fifty watt light bulb, that means that instantaneously that bulb takes fifty watts. If you want to run that battery for an hour, it's fifty watt hours. You know, if it's a if it's a thousand watts, it's one kilowatt hour. So if a thousand watt light bulb running burning for an hour will take one kilowatt hour out of your system. So you can equip, you can kind of. A, equalize these numbers a lot differently. So 100 times 12 is 1200 watt hours. So a, a Battleborn battery, theoretically, is uh, 1200 watt hours or 1.2 kilowatt hours. So the, the Leaf battery, uh, as it's spec brand new from Nissan, is a 24 kilowatt battery. So that's the equivalent of, you know, 24, was it 24 divided by 12 is, I don't know, 24, divided by 1.2. So that's like 20 Battleborn batteries is what the 24 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf battery. So you buy a full battery pack from uh, that's from a used car, uh, gently used let's say. We won't talk about derating and, and all that other stuff yet, just equ equivalency to equivalency. Mm -hmm. um, it's like having, so I paid 2400 plus a $500 core charge so $3,000 for that Nissan Leaf pack at the time in 2018. Um, a, the Battleborn batteries then are uh, $1,000 a piece. So if you take, you know, that's $20,000 of Battleborn batteries for $3,000. That's the price difference. But that's just the raw battery. The Battleborn has all that other stuff in there. The BMS, the safety, the packaging, the warranty, ten, you know, 10-year warranty on that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and other battery vendors are the same way. They all package that in. So now it's like you start, you know, you look at the Leaf batteries and you're like, oh yeah, that's a super awesome deal. I'm just going to wire all these batteries together and it's like, I'm done, you know? And then the, the issue is, is you start looking at it like really what's going on with that and you need the full package. You need the BMS, you need the infrastructure, you need the, the, the um, how is it assembled, where is it put in there, you know, all those things. And then think about later, like when something goes wrong, like... What is it, if it, if it, your battery just stops working one day and you're like, what happened? You don't have anybody you can call. You have to call yourself up and talk to yourself on the phone. Well, I think uh, what people watch this, their question with that would be, you know, rough estimate, how much, not including your time, you know, that's, that's a whole different thing. Like if you were having to hire somebody, yeah. but just your overall system, including the, the BMS, including all of the safety gear, including your total system. How much do you think you have into your your total system? Or have, have you have any rough estimates on that? Funny enough, I uh, was putting together a spreadsheet the other day because somebody, I, I get a lot of people asking about this. Like they, they're always, hey, I would love it if you could come out and design and install a, a solar system, a, a, a battery. And it's not just solar, it's like an off-grid system for me. Mm -hmm. And my answer, unfortunately, has been, I would love to, but I have a full-time job. I have four kids, my wife. I have, you know, we're trying to figure stuff out, and I don't have the space to build all that. And I I would love to build them, but I just don't think there's um, the space and the time. And then when you start really looking at the cost of it, like, what would this actually cost a client, a potential hypothetical client to do it? It usually blows them right out of the water, and they're like, no thanks. So... I put a rough estimate, um, let's see here, I listed an OEM pack, like this is this is the spreadsheet, I'll just kind of read it off. So material cost, just roughly, three grand for the battery, 
and then um, about I spent about 1200 probably on the frame like that's the actual all the metal work all the hanging bits the spray paint the welding the the bus bars, all that other stuff. And this goes is inside. DIY, or did this you is pay DIY. Someone? I right. did this. So that's I just, built that's all just this. Material. There's no labor here yet. Okay. So, uh, you know, reassembling the battery, like how much, the you know, what did it cost for all the little interconnects and all the shrink tubing and all the bits of wire and all that other stuff, the BMS. Um, so, twelve hundred for the frame, about four hundred bucks, and 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 random miscellaneous materials including those fancy quarter inch thick <laughs> copper bus bars because when you when you run 48 volts instead of 400 volts you have to account for the increase in amperage draw across the cells on those batteries because you're parallelizing a bunch of them um, the bms is about 1800 this is us dollars um, that included you know because the bms has all sorts of stuff it's got a computer it's got a a, a contactor it's got um there's, I kind of baked into that some relays and some other stuff, a bunch of other uh, data connectors and things like that, the actual shipping and handling, all that stuff that goes into that. Um, we won't include the solar charge controller for now, um, but you know, there's a DC distribution panel for high amperage. It's about 800 bucks to build that thing with all of the parts and pieces inside of that and figure the wire. I, I kind of figured in like the wiring because I used really heavy gauge, fine wire, uh, fine strand wiring to get mm -hmm. that DC distribution to, to work well because I got a the batteries here and the and the consumers are on the other side of the vehicle so you got to run a run of about 15 feet between the two um, thermal and safety so like heaters and and fans to keep it not too hot not too cold fire suppression system so there's a halotron system inside of it to keep it if it if it bursts into flame uh, it's going to potentially suppress the electrical components from f flaming on the battery. You're you're basically fucked if a if a if a if a uh, lithium battery goes up in flames. It's gonna go. It's kind of like lighting. You can't unlight a firecracker once. You can't unexplode a firecracker once it's going. You know. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you look into that. That's just the battery. Um, I don't have it all broken out for the battery versus the, the inverter system, but now you start looking at, okay, so what can consume this power that you've now created or storing with this battery? And it requires a pretty substantial inverter system, solar controllers, you need a AC distribution panel, a, DC, a, a low voltage DC distribution panel. So you really what this adds up to is, uh, it's about, uh, let's see, about $28,000 $28, if you add up all of the inverters, all the battery, all that other stuff, just the materials. So I've no probably labor. no labor yet. So I'm, I may be estimating a little high, but I know that I threw away a lot of crap, you know, ordering from Amazon or whatever. And this was also a learning thing because I had never done this before. So, you know, twenty-five dollars to $28,000 is probably a realistic price for the entire electrical system in our vehicle. Um, that includes the solar panels and everything else, but that's, that's, I mean, you take 28 to $30,000, what does that cost on a monthly basis to use that? What does utility bill cost, you know? And so every time we plug in somewhere, I kind of feel the, the, the burn of shame <laughs> realizing I'm just, I could have just friggin' plugged into a fancy power strip and been doing this instead of spending a gazillion dollars on this whole system, you know? So in terms of, so you have your $30,000, we'll just say $30,000 system, not including labor. Yeah. How is it actually working with your family? Cause you're a larger family yep. in a school bus with a washer and dryer, mm -hmm. AC running a decent amount, yep. you know? So what, how is the system performance it's been in, great in, in real life it's been really great there is certain times of the year in arizona where we should no reasonable person should exist in around phoenix outside in the summertime that's what i have my decision i think a lot of people probably agree with that you know it's like 115 degrees fahrenheit that's insane um we that system allows we can't actually exist just fully off grid with that there's that's too hot um the only reason we were down here in this that weather is because we were doing the engine rebuild. <laughs> so it was in Phoenix, and uh, um, 
so if if given a choice, we would have been up north. We would have been up in Oregon or Washington or Idaho or something like that. Maybe Montana or whatever. I think that's where you were hanging out. Yeah, it was you were hiding amazing. from the weather up in Montana. It was so amazing. Montana is amazing. I bet it was really beautiful, and the temperature was good, and all that other stuff. It's like 65, 70 during the day. Yeah. And at night, around 40, 45, just yep. out in the middle next to a lake. Yep. Just me and my dog. Well, I'm, I, that's kind of the thing I'm thinking of for next year is honestly, we, we will get the hell out of the Southwest again for the summer and we won't come back till it's like now, which is what, mid, late, mid November now. Yep. Yeah. It's, I got back. it's finally getting cool enough to not do that. So yep. air conditioning in extreme environments and actually the Technomadia folks, they said that right off the bat way back in 2013, don't go in extreme environments unless you want to plug in because you won't be able to. But one of the things I have been able to pull off is when we have been here, I can plug into a 15 amp extension cord and have <clears throat> solar augment and run as blast as much air conditioning as I want. So mm -hmm. it only took up that little bit of different, which tells me if I add a little generator to this whole shebang of bullshit that <laughs> I've got running, we would be fully off grid capable, mm -hmm. which would be cool. Um, I've kind of added a cheater thing after our engine rebuild. So I have like an alternator that can supply about a, a a kilowatt of power to the system so between those things if we're driving around and it's summer and hot we probably can make it now um that's just been more adding slathering on more layers on top of this over the time i think that's an important point because you have thirty thousand ish invested yeah. into your your system but you still need to augment power right you know when when you get to certain situations yep because I, I, it seems as though technology we have now, you can throw money at it, you can throw the best technology, but we're still not at the point to where you can be completely off the grid with a, if you need certain aspects of your system, like AC, which mm -hmm. is a massive draw, washer and dryer, I'm sure with that many kids in there, that's, that's going to decent amount. It's like not bad. Like we have highly efficient ones, but you know, yeah, if we're running, I'm, I'm more worried about running out, like wearing out the washer and dryer at this point, because it's like we're constantly doing laundry, than I am, um, than I am like consuming the power. They don't really use that much power. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll always run out of water before we can run out of power, basically with our with our washer and dryer. Right. So, so I, I made a little bit of a mistake with my system. So I knew I was getting lithium. I was going to get ten batteries. So. 100 amp hours a piece, so 1,000 amp hours of lithium. I was like, I'll just go ahead and get a 1,200 watt water heater. Yeah. But so far, that has proven to be a detriment to my system. Yeah. You know, a I was going to point detriment. out, so not only the cooling side, like in hot environments, so we have a heat pump. Our air conditioning is not just a cooler, it can heat too. Right. And in really cold weather, it's a huge. it would be a huge mistake to attempt to run that thing as a heat pump generating heat. I know mm -hmm. a couple people have done that. Um, Heat pump mode on most air conditioners basically consume the max that they're able to do. So mm -hmm. we have an 18,000 BTU unit, and when you put it in heat pump mode, it's pulling about one and a half kilowatts of power. Um, maybe eight, if you really crank it up to 90 degrees or whatever, I keep hitting that, um, <laughs> it could pull up to about 18 to 2,000 watts, or 1,800 to 2,000 watts. And mm -hmm. so it's just, you couple with when is it gonna be cold out? Usually in the winter time, <clears throat> so it's already cold and it's already dark, and so you have really short windows for solar and it's just a recipe for depleting your battery. Mm -hmm. So we solved the whole problem by getting a little cheap, cheap, cheap uh, Chinese diesel heater about this big, 200 bucks. It itself puts out 18,000 BTU of heat. So running a little bit of diesel fuel through it keeps the whole vehicle for consuming about, uh, I don't know, four amps of juice at 12 volts. It's like, it's, it's nothing. Right. And so that totally makes it so it's economical to keep our vehicle super comfortable in sub-zero conditions outside. Like we can, we have all the insulation that we've built out for the hot climate at reverse because all our bays are insulated, all our water tanks are insulated, everything else. Mm -hmm. We just take, we have two of those diesel heaters circulate the air through the basement back up and then everything else. And we can exist in, in sub-freezing temperatures, no problem. Right. And, uh, you know, it's then it's more of an issue of, well, now you need a block heater, so let's plug in the, you know, so it's like, it's this ever, never ending cycle of, of balancing your power and stuff. And so, to your credit, plugging in a water heater, um, I would have said, get a fuel powered water heater, get a diesel one or mm -hmm. get a propane one instead. Yeah, that, 
that that is definitely one of the biggest mistakes that I made on on my rig because I think people when they're like oh I'm gonna have nine or ten lithium batteries I don't need to worry about power but just like you're alluding to even if the system your that's the size of yours mm-hmm. it, there's still gonna be different things popping up to where you know my system actually shut off because I was using the water heater at night and it didn't have any supplemental solar coming in yeah so it completely drained my battery and then with charging my my laptop and the fridge kicking on throughout the night as well as my chest freezer mm-hmm. it shut shut down my system i got to yeah. 11.4 i saw it you know i, I log, we, we configured your uh the victron stuff to log into the vrm tool mm-hmm. and i i hadn't seen i've only i've done so little solar i am not a solar guru i just am a dude that set it up and made it work <laughs> and so you're my first like other person I've been able to watch on the VRM portal because you can add other people like if you're a Victron dealer you can manage all your installations and do all this health check stuff and so it's been super interesting because we've been parked each other for the last couple of days to compare the performance of the two systems mm-hmm. and um, you know I, I saw those dips I saw that go just way down to zero and back up again and it's pretty crazy that sounds like my kids beating on the bus <laughs> what if they're gonna set it on fire right next that's a, that's the other thing. I think the kids are more of a fire hazard than the battery system yeah, on my bus. I imagine. Well, um, another another issue. Um, so, those watching the YouTube video, you can see Aaron's bus in front of me. I actually moved my bus because another mistake that I made with my particular solar system is I got smaller panels and I put them on both sides of the rig. So there's a bank going down my driver's side and my passenger side. The idea of that was being able to hop up to the ceiling, be able to just have direct access to all my panels, just clean them off, and it wouldn't be a big deal. That didn't work out so well. So basically what I what happens is one of my banks gets a lot more sun. During well, it's certain, because they're angled. Exactly. They're, they're, they're angled on because, again, <clears throat> those that don't know that are just listening to this, I'm in a school bus. So it has an arch on the ceiling. So one bank is angled one direction obviously the others angled the other direction so during the morning for example when i was in bed i was on my laptop getting some work done i was keeping an eye on my solar charge controllers and the victron charge controllers i have has a little readout that shows how many amps are coming in and the voltage of the batteries yeah one bank was bringing in i think it was 28 amps the other was bringing in seven yeah so i actually maneuvered my bus to directly face the sun because my power was so low so that was definitely another mistake that I make, so I have 1,700 watts. It's like, that'll be enough, and it might have a little bit of variance, but now we're in wintertime here in Arizona. That extra angle. That angle is absolutely killer, because yeah. I don't know what my system's at now, but earlier, it's noon right now, but earlier it was around 11, maybe 10.30 when I checked it. Yeah. It's only bringing in about six 650 watts, yeah. you know? And with, with the fridge and the iMac and my freezer, it had a draw of like 250 so trying to get that battery back up after using that hot water heater mm-hmm. it's it's almost a struggle well i think know? that's a really good ex- <clears throat> like um dis- description of how critical it is to really really consider every single piece of your system so mm-hmm. like i'm not i'm not here to bash your system chris but i will point out <laughs> that angling them probably wasn't the best thing because oh, yeah. you, you would treat them you basically if you have two different angles of solar panels they're two separate arrays is mm-hmm. what you consider them and so you ang- treat them differently if you if you w- like one of the things i built was a huge excel spreadsheet of insulation potential uh simulation across different latitudes and weather and things like that and panel angles because i was thinking maybe i'll make the panels tilt and all this other crazy stuff and I just settled on, I'm lazy, I'm not going to tilt the panels, I'm not going to rotate the vehicle around because I may not have choices, so I'm going to lay them flat. It'll be a super compromise, but that's the way it is. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you have two different panels, you can see as the curve of the sun goes throughout the day how those react and change. And so it's like, it, you know, it's good that you have, you you kind of fell into some luck with with putting that together because you have two separate solar controllers you have a, a charge con- two charge controllers one for each section the one angled one way mm-hmm. and one angled the other way so they're not fighting each other right um but you know that was probably not the best des- design choice in the world um no, the other it? is uh running a low voltage system you know you are only running a 12 volt system i think a 24 36 or 48 would be better for your setup because your amperage limited like that one um, inverter you've got, at, at, you're kind of at the 
maximum end of, of easy to get components like 4 aught power cable. Once you go above 4 aught, you're just talking solid copper blocks that you're connecting stuff together effectively. Right. And those get really expensive. So it's like if you were to double your voltage, you could half the size of your conductors. So and it's like. Absolutely, because we, we talked about that. Yeah. And maybe I'll have to get with Battleborn, but they suggested sticking with 12 volt. And I don't know if that's changed. I don't know. And it's a system compatibility thing. I think yeah. they were really worried about you being able to charge off that alternator. And of course, if you have a 12 volt alternator, you have to step up the voltage to something to mm -hmm. get to 24 or higher. And what, for those uh, listening, watching, so there is the option of actually charging your battery system, like most vehicles, just from your your engine. Uh, with this bus, it is a 12 volt alternator. So essentially I'd have to add, which is what Wes did, I believe, he actually added a secondary alternator mm -hmm. that is uh, 24 volt, I believe, or yeah, it might have he, been. 48. He bought a 24 volt alternator, right? So yeah. that that alternator is directly connected to his battery bank because he didn't go lithium. Yeah, he went with uh, I believe it was lead acid. Uh, he went, well, yeah, he went with uh, H spiral AGM. Yeah. Oh, he went with AGM. Yeah. Okay. Pretty sure. But uh, he had a completely different system where with mine it's just the the stock alternator that could be powering the bank. Yeah. I mean, so the thing is, is that you could go, like I have a 48 volt system and I'm, it, I'm charging off of an alternator, but I'm not doing it directly. I, it's a Rube Goldberg contraption of an alternator that's 12 volt with a battery sink to have the power go somewhere so you don't burn up the alternator. And then that's connected to a auxiliary 12 to 120 volt inverter that creates 120 volts AC pure sine power. That inverter then feeds into a secondary shore, like a generator inlet on my 48 volt inverter charger system. Mm. So there's an inverter that's simulating like a generator and then feeds into the standard charging system. So it's all regulated and managed in that same system. But the thing is, is that I looked into 48 volt alternators and it's like the cost of a decent 48 volt alternator was so high. It was like, ah, I'm just going to do this other thing. And so it's like you start, Everything compounds itself. When you start getting into higher power, higher spec systems like that, everything gets more expensive. Like if you want to go 48 and you want to just have a simple, a, a, a simple DC breaker for 40 that's truly 48 volts. Um, you'll look at most 48 volt breakers you can buy on Amazon or whatever. Let's say 48, or let's say 47.9 volts or something. There's this weird little thing they do, and so basically to get a true 48 volt breaker, it's like way more expensive because you're arc quenching the voltage the, the higher voltage can make big sparks and stuff especially dc and uh so like a, a 48 volt system nominally is full full charge on a battery storage system at 56 volts so actually you need something that's rated at least 56 volts for a breaker and realistically you'll find them rated at 70 or plus 70 or so volts or, or more so to get a dc breaker to just simply trip you know, to be a safety for a piece of wire going to something, instead of paying 10 bucks for a 12 volt breaker that you can get at AutoZone or you can get at Amazon, you're paying a hundred dollars for a breaker. And mm -hmm. it's like, to really do it. You know, I've seen people, they, they go, well, I'll use this AC breaker. It's rated at 120 volts or 240. And it's like, yeah, AC, not DC. If you actually try to use an AC breaker on 48 volts DC, it would just set on fire potentially, <laughs> because what'll happen is it'll break the contact and then instead you'll just have a little plasma, a big, huge, continuous arc, like a welding arc going across that until it finally quenches the spark by burning out the breaker. You know, it's like, I, there's just a, it, it, as soon as you get into higher voltage systems and, and by that extension, higher power systems, it gets really expensive. Like I just, I don't know, there's no other way around it. You could build them cheaply, which usually it's like that engineering trifecta of safe or uh, cheap, good, and fast. You get to pick two of those. Mm -hmm. um, you can kind of replace good with safe. It's kind of an interchangeable thing. I've seen high voltage systems that I would probably not want to place any of my valuables in or near. <laughs> and I've seen ones that were really inexpensive, but they took so much effort from that person. Like they literally traded materials for time. They built all the pieces themselves, or they scavenged them from stuff everywhere, and it's like it took them years to build it because they're pulling things from old telecom systems or 
all sorts of things. And now it's like the only person that understands or will understand how that works is themselves. And, and that's something that my system has sort of drifted towards is like, I've got an engineering book. And when, if, if we sell this someday, it's going to have a full man, it has a full manual and everything with like how it's all put together. It's put together with relatively industry standard parts and stuff, but it's still complex. And, um, any way you slice it, a high power system, the complexity goes up higher and all this other stuff. And so there's like, you got to really decide whether that's going to be useful for you. Um, you could take something like this, chop it in half and make it a 24 volt system and make it a lot less expensive, but you lose all the capability. Like you're really going to run 18,000 BTU of air conditioning, washer and dryer and all this other stuff and support the kids. And, you know, I think the thing is, is that there's nothing wrong with doing that. You look at uh, the marine industry for like yachts and boats and things like that. It's that's kind of where my background lies and in, in seeing this stuff before, uh, not working on it, but you know being exposed to it, being around it. And so I kind of copied that model. And you look at yachts and things like that, and yeah, that that's what they are. They're just like this, and they in some cases they're still simpler because they have the luxury of using all of those lead acid batteries for ballast. So right. they can, they need the weight. And so I can't have any of the weight on ours, you know, whenever you're driving a rig around like this. And so, so what's the sweet spot, man, for people that are, you know, thinking about rigs, they're wanting to go off the grid. I mean, is it, you're going to be paying your money or you, you'll have to get something that's not too safe or like what, what should people be looking into if they're looking to go off the grid, not be in RV parks all the time, but they don't have the money to, to shell out for this stuff. I'll tell you my competing, this is my, my leading theory right now. And the leading theory is this. When you go to a sporting goods store and you see all that cool shit at the sporting, sporting goods store, you see all the, the tactical shit if you're into <laughs> guns or the super awesome and neat stuff if you're into guns, or maybe it's the, the fishing pole with the bazillion things on it, or like all that hiking gear, that sub-zero climate, and the awesome shoes, and all the equipment, and all that stuff. You look at the marketing on it, and you look at how it's put together. You see some guy climbing, like, you know, K2 or Mount Everest or whatever. Or they see some dude in Antarctica using this thing. It's like, oh, that's for me. If it works for that guy, it'll work for me. It's this human disposition to um, assume that I want the very best. Mm -hmm. And if you want the very best, you're going to pay for the very best. And in most cases, the marketing half of all the stuff you see, as far as power, RVs, anything, they're always telling you it's the best. The reality is it's always an engineering compromise all the time. It doesn't matter what it is. There's always an engineering compromise in anything. It doesn't matter if it's a space shuttle. Well, a space shuttle is just a huge engineering compromise. Let's not talk about that <laughs> one. Um, uh, Maybe uh, SpaceX is a pretty awesome thing. It's, you know, they got landing reusable rockets, but those are full of engineering compromises as well. Um, I'm not comparing our, my vehicle to a SpaceX <laughs> rocket, but I am saying that anytime you're considering what you're truly really going to use it for, you have to be very honest with yourself. If you say that you're going to build a 100% off-grid vehicle, and I, this may be fighting words for anybody who's listening, but... All those people that say, I'm 100% off grid and I never plug in ever, I think they're lying. <laughs> I think they eventually sometimes plug into stuff. When, it, when it's available, I'm sure. And, and it, more importantly, is if they can honestly say they've never plugged their vehicle in because it's fully off grid, it's likely that they're compromising in some other way because they're totally okay with um, hanging their clothes on a clothesline, washing their clothes in a bucket. Uh, cooking with gas only and living right. in the dark with candles like that's <laughs> there is nothing wrong right. with doing that like it's totally fine but that was that's not a way I want to live and I think a way a majority of people want to so you have to be super honest about what right. you're really going to do because of that water heater I've taken my full a fair share of lukewarm to cold showers yep because I'm I'm parked somewhere boondocking and I'm in a forest and the trees are blocking out my sun for yeah just two hours out of the day that, that two hours is what dictates to me not be able to have hot water or not. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's, and it's for that day, you've earned your off grid, off grid living badge. Like it was awarded to you at the end of the day, <laughs> right. but to what degree did you really want that badge? And the thing is, mm. is that for people that say, oh, I always live off grid. What about that time you spent the time at somebody's house? What about the time that you stayed in a, 
at right. a hotel or whatever. You weren't living off grid. You flew then. back home to you flew back home to their parents and hung out to, for Christmas or whatever. The reality is, is yeah. nobody lives off grid. I think that's the actual for real, real. Well, I think that's definitely true because even if you're off grid, you're still using road systems. You're still using road systems. You're, you're still, still filling up fuel. the gas stations you're that's powered by power. <laughs> talking to people, talking to people. People are part of the grid. The idea of off grid to me is a misnomer. It's like it's a concept. <laughs> if you were living on the moon, I think that's kind of off. On the dark side of the moon, with no communications, that's that's off grid. It's pretty. You can't grid. see the Earth because literally the entire of, entirety of humanity currently is on the other side of the moon, <laughs> and you're off grid. Finally, you got the sun coming in. You got no air. You know, you're recirculating your farts and your and everything else. You living on the food that you brought, but as soon as you run out of food, you're fucked, <laughs> or air, or whatever it is. And so then you got to get back on the grid again. Right. So. I think that's to be to, to dial it back to reality here. <laughs> Living off grid is a compromise. It is a way to mm -hmm. live with reduced uh, resources. And so the whole point of this stuff was to reduce the resource consumption that I need. And so by spending thirty thousand dollars on equipment up front, what I've done is I've prepaid my ability to reduce <laughs> the equipment the, the the longer resources thing. Now you could get into all the details about how many resources, how much, let's just use a real fine, a, a, a pertinent um, exchange media, carbon credits. How many carbon credits or car, how much carbon dioxide, CO2, did it put in the atmosphere to get the inverter generated, created, like manufactured? Mm -hmm. It was built in India or China. It was shipped here on a big ass boat. You know, I, I don't know. And so, you know, I did the best I could because I'm only capable of so much stuff. I can't build a lithium battery pouch in my garage. I can't build that inverter. I had to buy that stuff. And then look locally, um, it's about what can I do to just be not reliant? What do I need to be, have not a dependency? It's not, it's not grid independent. It's about being less grid reliant. And so it allows me to, to um, deal with... Um, changes and plans it allows me to when an rv park says you can't go there because you're a bus conversion you're not a reva certified whatever or something like that i'll be like okay and so then um we go park at a rest stop or whatever and it's like it's fine we got all our power necessities and everything else instead of panicking and figuring out where the right. hell we're going to do stuff or running all these compromises like a big ass generator how are you going to run your fridge yeah so how that's that's what the free it, it, it affords that how often do you guys actually find yourself out in the middle of nowhere, like BLM, public land, or do you stay fairly close to cities and park in RV parks? Like, what's what's the well, ratio on that? With our kids, you know, we want to have trappings of civilization. Mm -hmm. um, we don't... I don't think we're trying to raise our kids to be a bunch of people that have just live in the woods or whatever, <laughs> right. or the desert. Like uh, Mr. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm not Captain Fantastic, <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah, Captain Fantastic. Um, and so... <laughs> you know, we we do stay close. I I I work full time, and so I kind of need to stick around mm -hmm. the the areas where there's cell phone reception coverage. Right. Um, well, we like just... we like real good. We like good food. Right. It's just like the other night, you guys went and had yogurt and went went to watch a movie. Yeah. Yeah, you know? and it's like you can't. I mean, you could go. I could go out to Quartzsite, but it'd be a 250 mile drive to get here from from Quartzsite, and it's like, eh, I don't want to do that. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, we tend to stick around, and so. It is a lot easier to go, and and the funny thing is, is that it turns into any place you can pay to park for legitimately, they always have hookups, and so I tend to play the game of, I don't hook up. I'll like, we'll park, and then I'll just not. There's been a couple parks where they actually bill by the night for power, like they reset the power meter. You're getting a little bit of that thirty thousand back. I get a little bit back on those ones, <laughs> and what's really fun is when I don't plug in, and they look at me after I've been there for four or five days, and it's been hot out, and they're like. Are you stealing electricity? Because I don't see the meter. You know, when we check out, and they're like, no, I just ran off the solar because I didn't want to pay your power bill. <laughs> well, we still need to bill you the minimum. And I'm like, really? I never plugged in. It still says zero on your meter. And so there's this... Charge them for pets. Charge them for yeah. your tow car. They're yeah, always getting charge those little extra pennies. all those little things. In yeah, there. They, they, they want their money. Right. And so, um, and, and to be honest, we need water. And water is a grid thing, usually. Like, I have it set up, I could go suck water out of a river or something and filter it on a micron level for cysts and all that other stuff, but bacterially I'd still need to treat it, and 
You know, it's like, do I want to do that? No, it's a pain in the ass. It's way easier to find a water spigot with potable water and just fill it up. Mm -hmm. So there's there's sort of a dependency there. Like, we don't stray too far until, if, as long as you can find water. That's kind of our other thing. And so, yeah, I, I'd say it's like 50-50 right now. I'd love it to be a more higher percentage of, of uh, off-grid stuff because it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't cost as much. At this point, the the power infrastructure is a sunk cost. It's like a giant hobby slash toy slash living inside of it sort of thing right. because we can. Right. Um, I still find joy when my kids want to toast a bunch of pop tarts or whatever in the morning, and they don't worry. We don't worry about the power. Like, oh, is the batteries high enough? No, it's fine. You know, they don't worry about it. I do. I'm always <laughs> worrying about it. Right. But to watch them make, you know, like make coffee, make toast do tv laptops all their computer stuff the schooling all that other things there's never been a worry about that and i think that's the thing that has really been the most valuable out of all of the stuff that could be done is that we can le live a relatively normal um to what we've experienced before we moved into an rv or a bus uh life without having to worry about all of the the um, logistics of getting to being normal again. Mm -hmm. So we can be parked in the middle of a wash in Arizona, in the middle of nowhere in the desert, and it all still works. And that's probably, that peace of mind is extremely valuable. Um, I went through that sort of with the engine rebuild. I just had a leaking head gasket, but ended up doing a full in-frame rebuild. And uh, the peace of mind of going through the whole damn motor and putting it back together again is was totally worth the extra money spent doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think in this case, there was peace of mind knowing that I don't have to worry about all this stuff. I don't need to be concerned about plugging in. I don't need to worry, has the generator been serviced? Is the batteries not charging right? Is, you know, or whatever those things are. Right. So there's sort of a, it's a, it's a soft cost that you can't see. Well, and you have more incentive being that you have you know, X amount of people that completely depend on that bus as home, where if that, if something happens and you actually have to move out, yeah, paying for a hotel for an entire family, like it's it expensive, just dealing with all that, where it's a lot easier for me to where if something happened with the bus and they're not allowing me to park, like live in here, I can literally just take a sleeping bag and put it in the back of my car, yeah, take some canned tuna, yeah, and I'm okay. Like, when you got my wife, four kids, two dogs, and a cat. <laughs> <laughs> we recently got it's like yeah i totally understand that peace of mind living like, a lot closer to the edge that mm -hmm. way and in some cases we're riding with more risk than you are oh because absolutely. of that and so absolutely. Th there's a no that's, there's a risk there's a risk mitigation factor to this and so to go back mm -hmm. to the like can you do it with less and what i was saying about being realistic it's really asking yourself what are you really going to do if you really truly really are going to be living in the desert 95 percent of the time you're going to want to spend all that money and build that thing out. Or really what you'd probably do is go find a piece of property and build a shack that's off grid and, you know, mm -hmm. build an earth ship or something like right. that. But, um, the, the reality is, is that most people do connect up a lot. They do stay in RV parks and stuff a lot. And to try to, if the closer you can build out your system spec and design to your actual, um, activities that you will be doing and it's tough to predict the future because you don't know what you're going to do just like the changes that make with this right just the changes here um the 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 more satisfied you are it's like kind of like um the um what's the phrase the when you have a difference in expectations to reality the farther the potential is for that the more unhappiness there is in things mm -hmm. when your expectations are exactly right on with reality usually you're at the happiest. And that goes for so many things in life. It goes mm -hmm. for if you've got a customer that you're doing business with, uh, goes with your partners, it goes with the people you talk to, any activities. The farther the expectations from reality, the more it's gonna suck. And so if I had built this crazy off-grid thing and we literally just couldn't go anywhere and we're parked in, a, uh, um, in an RV park for 365 days a year, I'd have been really disappointed. It would have sucked. Absolutely. What was the point of any of that? Um, if I had built um, three batteries wired together with alligator clips and a single solar panel and a big loud uh, harbor freight generator, and we lived off grid 100% of the time, that also would have been like we would have been living the life of off grid all the time. But 
I'd be filling up the fuel all the time and throwing away the generator every three months because it wear out <laughs> and get another one. It's like, ah, Jesus, I don't want to do that. So it's, it's that compromise. So in retrospect, do you like with, with if you can get your thirty thousand dollars back and you pay three thousand dollars for a Honda generator that lasts a year and it's just on consistently, mm. would you go the that route with the Honda generator or no. are you happy with the I the love route? being completely silent. The only thing I hear is a slight hum of the in, of the inverters doing their work occasionally and there's a cooling fan that comes on once in a while. Mm-hmm. I get tremendous joy out of making a cup of coffee in the morning knowing that it was 100% heated up by the sun. <laughs> How cool is that? Like, right. there's, I, I, I sort of get annoyed when I'm running the clothes dryer because I could just hang the damn clothes outside, but, you know, because the, the, the dryer is running off the sun, too. You put in the extra effort, so why, why, well, why not enjoy it? I don't have to hang a string, and sometimes it's raining out. You know, it's yeah. like, so there's, it's like that, it's a quality of life thing. And so... Uh, you know, every, I like the fact that my cell phone, when I use it, I get to walk. It's like a little knowing in the back of my head, mine runs, my, I've got a solar powered <laughs> cell phone, you know, or a solar powered blender or a solar powered anything. Yeah. Technically it's solar powered and I can prove it because we never plug in in those cases. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know. It's kind of like, uh, it doesn't mean anything. It's not, it doesn't really make any differences in the way anything works or whatever, but it's, it's, there's some pride in that. Mm-hmm. and that you're doing it and i think that there's some value in that you know um i think that more importantly though you have to decide there's all these factors that go into this into play in this like it costs this much it's this much effort what's the actual return what is the x factor for all these things to put it together and if you're just doing it just because somebody told you don't do that mm-hmm. do it because you want to do something and that that's the same for living in a converted school bus, I think, or whatever, too. It's like, do it because you want to, not because everybody said it's awesome. Right. Um, I think it's awesome to have off-grid solar and all this stuff. But don't, t- like uh, LeVar Burton says, but don't take my word for it, right? Remember mm-hmm. that reading Rainbow? So, yep. And so it's like, you got you to gotta really decide. It, if you believe in it, then it's, then it's right. And I, doesn't, I don't think it matters what scale it is. If you've spent an inordinate amount of money on it and you believe in it or you spent five bucks on it and you borrowed some stuff trash that was dumped off the freeway and you've managed to wire that into an off-grid solution mm-hmm. you should be proud of that because you believed in it and i think that's okay i think it's also one of the 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 competing factors for that though is is it make sure that it's safe make sure that you're not deluding yourself or talking yourself like you're not saying it as an affirmation of a bad choice and a bad choice is subjective because it only has to lead you to accomplishing the task at hand whatever that is if it's Mm -hmm. off-grid or whatever yeah i think there's definitely a generational difference between you know doing videos online at people's tiny homes it seems as though the uh younger people that are doing this are definitely more into doing the off-grid thing, whether it be the composting toilet, investing in lithium, doing the full solar, just trying to live within the means. Because it seems as though a lot of the people that I know in vans, they are very conscious of actually toning down what they want to do. When they realize with their fridge, hey, I got to pay an extra $600 to get this fridge. It only takes, you know, it would be maybe an amp difference. Yeah. You know, an amp hour difference. And they're just like spending that $600 because they... Or just paring everything down. Yeah. You know, the fridge is their main draw, and they might have their laptop. Right. And then that's it. Where the older generation, I remember when I was I was distributing or looking for options to distribute the Nature's Head composting toilet, mm-hmm. and I I went into a building and they had a bunch of booths set up. I was like, does anybody have composting toilets in here? And they literally laughed at me. Yeah. Like, what what are you talking about composting yeah. toilet? Why would RV? you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, so I'm intrigued to see how this is going to move forward if people are going to start paring down versus just getting bigger systems, but it could just be dependent on the the person. Well, I think there's a generation, you know, I won't get into why, but, you know, you look at my parents' age and the size of the houses and all the choices that were made, and lots of people love that there is a uh, going, in the United States at least, there's a going love of gigantic houses. Like mansions everywhere. 3,000 square foot, 5,000 square foot house. Um, Then generally because they economically have the ability to do that well i've got the money so i might as well buy the thing and then there's other people that i think and i 
it's my, my, my perception or whatever. I'm not trying to be PC, it's just what I see. But folks my age and younger, they're like, well, I got the money, but I'm going to go buy a thousand square foot place or whatever. Um, you could scale that into, and, I, and I, when you were talking earlier about the van and, and just setting realistic expectations, one of the things I always consider is um, if you have a person, let's just say a single person living in a van, like the, doing the van life thing, mm -hmm. the van is so big, it's got so much space, it has so much power and capabilities and water. I figure we're six people and there's this distribution curve. So if you take six of those vans with six of those infrastructures and six of those everything in it and try to package it into a 40 foot section, you're not going to. It's actually gonna be bigger than that. A caravan of six van life people mm -hmm. will be consuming more stuff and have more resources than a single vehicle. So it's like an economy of scale. There's people on the other end. I know of people that I've seen on Instagram and Facebook and stuff that have 10 people or, or 12 people living in a 40 foot vehicle and they're doing with less stuff than what we've got. Mm. But I also question what else are they showing? That's really tough to see what the other side of the page is with these things. How often are they not living in the vehicle? How are they staying at family or friends or so they're places? They're just using it for uh, Instagrammable photos. Yeah, Instagrammable photos. Take it out for the weekend. Right, so everybody's leading their own life. And so don't ever, like that's maybe another piece of advice is don't ever just try to try to carbon copy somebody's life that you see on on social media because it's not real it's always the highlights yeah it's always the highlights and i found that when i post realistic stuff nobody ever clicks like <laughs> on my stuff and then i don't get that little endorphin rush of somebody clicking the like button they're taking so, it away next week yeah and it's it's like it's kind of sad a little bit i don't Inst get that you won't have to worry yeah. about it. instagram's taking it away yeah so i think it, it you know in summary a big solar system is super great, but uh, it's kind of expensive and a huge pain in the ass, and you got to really want it really bad. Mm -hmm. And you can make do with a lot less, but it's, you know, you don't want to do too less because then you'll be feeling shitty and whatever and unhappy. Uh, there it goes again. You got to um, get it in three yeah, times. Yeah, I got it three times. <laughs> um, so it's it's that it's that being I think it's be realistic about like truly realistic like some soul searching is required. It's not a decision mm -hmm. you're going to make in a week. It's like think about it over terms of a little longer than that. Mm -hmm. You really want this or not, and being honest about your capabilities and what you can pay. Um, you know you don't want to build you don't want to build the equivalent of a four thousand square foot house when you only have yourself living in it. Mm -hmm. You don't want to build a 600 square foot house with 14 people living in it either. So it's somewhere in the middle. And for our comfort and desire and my proclivity towards nerdiness and knowing how this stuff worked, this worked for me. I can take care of it. I understand it. I can document it and describe it to people. Mm -hmm. Other people that don't know, um, they need to either decide what is your immediate journey going to look like? Are you looking to get on the road right now? Or are you doing it in four years from now? In four years, you could learn all this stuff, no problem. If you're trying to get done next week or three, three or six months from now, you need to change your mind or you're going to pay a lot of money. Right. And you won't understand it when you're done. Right. And you'll have to then learn it afterwards. So it's all about deciding those factors. And I think, you know, that's, there is no true answer. Like, it's not, so small solar isn't the way to go and gigantic solar isn't the way to go it's every single person's situation in life is unique we're all we all want to be different like everybody else and so the thing is is that there's generalizations that you can make there's a bell curve of approaches and so you find where you're at on that curve and you find where the the population generally agrees with you and within that subset of that curve and then you can go ahead and commit to that sort of thing and, and make it work. But to say that there's one way to do it, no. There's infinite ways to do this stuff. And so um, the only the only stand the only thing that's constant is the variation of all of that. I think. So, so basically, do your research, figure out what you really to need, do your research, and be more than willing to scale it down to actually change your living situation to fit better what the realistic goal is. Yeah, be very realistic and think about all of the aspect of those choices. Because, the you know, when you're taking a shit in the dark with no hot water, and nobody likes that. <laughs> if you have a heated toilet seat and uh, all the lights on and TVs and you're just 
setting electricity on fire in your vehicle because it's got midnight it. and it's midnight and in, you're in Alaska and, and you're drinking your cold beer from your solar powered refrigerator. Yes. <laughs> then um, you're probably living life on the high, but that's also an extreme luxury. So you're paying for that. somehow. Yeah. Yep. So it's, it's finding that middle ground always. Awesome. Well, thanks for your time today. Yeah. <laughs> Part one. <laughs>